This episode is brought to you by Patriot Gold. Good afternoon, Michael Malice here. Let that be your welcome for the next hour. It's guys, I am actually giddy at our next guest. We have with us Brett Weinstein, co-host of the Dark Horse Podcast, co-author of A Hunter Gatherer's Guide to the 21st Century. I don't know if you know this, by the way. I worked on a book called The Paleo Manifesto, which came out several years prior, and I learned a lot from that. We'll be talking about that a bit. People might know Brett because he had been a professor of evolutionary biology at Evergreen State, and then a lot of unpleasantness happened, and then he became associated with, uh, for lack of a better term, the intellectual dark web. And I told you before we started recording that one of my favorite ways to troll people is to give them compliments that are sincere because it makes them very uncomfortable and they don't know how to react. So here we go. I was in Florida uh, recording for Peterson Academy and it was taking a lot out of me. And Ruben, Dave Ruben, our friend is like, hey, let's grab dinner. Let me invite Brett. And I'm like, I, I don't like meeting people. Uh, I only knew Eric and Eric and I are both prickly people. And I'm like, I'm, I'm exhausted. I might have to be on. Like, I, I, I don't know. I can't remember the last time I was as impressed with someone that I met as I was with you. And I'll tell people why. First of all, everything you had to say was both interesting and grounded in reality instead of some, versal, um, some visceral, like tribal, well, Republicans, bad, Democrats, good. You were funny. You were engaging in that you were listening to everything both of us were saying, taking into account instead of waiting for your time to talk. You were open you know, about concerns that you had and, and didn't have a chip on your shoulder. You had the total package. So I was completely blown away by that dinner. Uh, I'm really glad to have you here on the show. Um, and I'm sure your impression of me was less positive than mine was of you, but that's fine. Um, one of the first thing I wanted to talk to you about is you have been one of the foremost uh, people in the public space talking about how the two party system is broken, broken, trying to find ways to maybe salvage it or fix it. And I saw very recently you were saying that you thought Robert Kennedy Jr. would be a good fit via the Libertarian Party to uh, kind of fix what's, what, what's what, what once went wrong in a quantum leap kind of way. I would love to hear you expound upon that. First of all, hey, thanks for having me. Um, and uh, with respect to my impression of you when we met, I thought you were okay. <laughs> that's usually that's an upgrade from usual. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I'm just kidding with you. Um, I had a great evening. I don't even think it was the wine. I think it would have been the same without the wine. But um, anyway, yeah. Um, well, let's let's dive right in, right where you suggest, and talk about the destruction of our system at the hands of forces that are. Um, deeply uncomfortable, let's say, with the consent of the governed and have other yeah. plans for us. And my sense is that we have really two options on the table at this point for addressing that issue. One of them is Trump, who right. is clearly not of the machine. And the other is Bobby Kennedy Jr. And my sense is that I don't know if the system is actually rescuable. I don't have any reason to believe it's too late to do it, but I know that it's very late. We have ignored the problem for far too long. And I know Robert Kennedy Jr. personally. I don't know him terribly well, but we've certainly met in person, had many conversations, and he is encyclopedically knowledgeable about many topics at the heart of our national and above national problem. He is also deeply patriotic. He is extremely courageous. And he is not, as far as I can tell, driven by ego. Okay. I think he really wants to return us to the course that he believes that his father and his uncle were 
setting us towards and that he is in striking distance to attain an office in which he might have the power to do that, I find to be an epic story. So there are certainly places where he and I disagree on some issues. They're issues that, in fact, I think trip up many libertarians who can't see the potential in partnering with Kennedy. But I, I just don't think that's where we are in history. I actually think the republic is in jeopardy. And the idea that we should find common cause across effectively all ideological lines, every patriot should be aligned with the idea that whatever our best move is to, to right the ship of state and to expel those who have captured it, that ought to be what we do. And at the point that the crisis is over, we can go back to fighting about our ideological differences. They, they do exist, but they're minor compared to the question about whether the nation and the West survive. I'm just curious how you see him as being a libertarian, capital L. Well, I don't see him as being a libertarian, capital okay. L. I know he's not, and I'm not, but I also know that at the moment when I sit down with libertarians that I like and respect, our differences amount to very little compared to our concerns about where the country is. So no, he's not a libertarian with a capital L. He is a libertarian with a small L, as am I. You know, anyone biased in the direction of minimizing governmental interference and maximizing individual liberty is a small L libertarian. Um, so, I, you know, he is one. And, and I was also present at Freedom Fest, which is the largest libertarian annual conference that they hold. Right. And I was there for his speech, which he gave. And he didn't pander to the audience at all. He, he gave it to him straight in terms of how he sees the world. But it was very favorable because the fact is um, the differences are small relative to the commitment to, uh, to liberty and to the nation. I have gone on record and I'm, I want to pick your brain because I trust your judgment and your interpersonal judgment uh, that I think he's a sociopath. So I want to really? make that clear. Yes. And, and I'll, I'll give you my receipts and I, I, maybe this is information you'd hadn't had previously. So I think when someone, I think it's um, when people, there's lots of reasons I could wrap my head around people being anti-gun. I mean, the reasons are pretty clear. Like, listen, the argument is gun proliferation, proliferation leads to you know some data points are going to get those guns and we're all going to agree they shouldn't get the oh my god that's so cute <laughs> the dog uh some data points agree they shouldn't have these guns and then you have school shootings and all these other things something has to be done i understand the argument completely the argument that senators from wyoming or south dakota have somehow been bought into being pro-gun by the nra is a disingenuous one and, and he said this. That is something I don't think you could say honestly. Well, uh, you know, I would have to look at... I got the, the quotes. You've got the quote. I, I would still want to see it said. Let, but let, I'm, let I'm, me, you, let's go lay, through lay these. Lay the quotes on me if you want. Sure. Yeah, because but that's not even the biggest one because that's not sociopathy. That's whatever. This is the one where I'm like, okay. Um, he blamed, before he was blaming the CIA, he was blaming right-wing extremism for what happened to his uncle being shot in um, Dallas in 63. Let me read the quote from him, okay? Okay, I want the dates on these things. Sure, uh, this is not recent, uh, absolutely. Um, Jack, had re Jack, meaning JFK, had received myriad warnings against visiting the right-wing Texas city. Indeed, there had been a sense of foreboding even within our family as he and Jackie, Aunt Jackie, prepared for the trip. Blah, blah. Jack's death forced a national bout of self-examination. In 1964, Americans repudiated the forces of right-wing hatred and violence with a historic landslide in the presidential election between LBJ and Goldwater. For a while, the advocates of right-wing extremism receded from the public forum. Now they have returned with a vengeance to the broadcast medium media and to prominent positions in the political landscape. And this was in reference to the Gabby Gifford shooting. He goes, Gabby Giffords lies in a hospital room fighting for her life 
and a precious nine-year-old girl is dead along with five others. Let's pray for them in our country and hope this tragedy prompts another round of examination of conscience. I don't think you can honestly say, uh, anyone, that it's right-wing extremism that was to blame for Gabby Giffords, who was killed, I think he was a socialist, or JFK, who was killed by a literal communist. And I think when someone is be saying that, they're not being, it's not an honest opinion. Well, look, I, I get what you're saying. Um, I would want to ask Bobby this sure. directly, but my impression is I believe you're just simply off base. And I would say the problem, I don't know how far back to go here, but Heather and I talk on our podcast sometimes about something I call the Cartesian crisis. And the Cartesian crisis is a reference to Descartes. And Descartes became very concerned when he realized what fraction of what he understood to be facts, assumptions that he took in thinking about things, what fraction he had never been, he had never checked himself. And in fact, you can't, right? Almost everything we believe is a fact. It's not something that we have established by direct observation. It's something that we have taken on a kind of faith, you know, the entire periodic table. What are the chances that you have established any of the things reported as facts on the periodic table? The we believe something is true because it feels true in our minds. So at, well, in a certain because, sense, there's an emotional aspect. Because there's some story in which yeah. Mendeleev had a dream that resulted in him putting together the first periodic table and that dedicated chemists have added pieces to it and refined the meaning, blah, blah, blah. But the point is, at the end of the day, it's some kind of an appeal to authority. Yeah. And in order to understand how secure it is, you have to say, well, what would have to be true in order for the periodic table to be wrong? What would have to be true for there not to be something called a neutron and a proton right. and for, you know, so, et cetera. You, Descartes, upon realizing the fraction of what he knew that was taken socially rather than through direct observation, became concerned and he started working backwards and he ultimately arrived at cogito ergo sum i think therefore i am as the one thing that he could establish to start working forward in the other direction right now, i think it's a cruddy proof i think it's a cheat um and i think it's a necessary cheat uh let me be clear about that descartes bought us something in uh framing that initial supposedly factual claim um, because you're sort of stuck in a, in a, in a bind. If you really recognize that it's a cruddy proof and you think, well, I certainly wouldn't want to reason on top of anything that wasn't clear, then you will spend your entire life trying to prove that you actually exist, which right. you can't do. So you'll make no progress on any front. Right. Um, and it will waste your life. On the other hand, if you take that one on faith, you can begin to move from there, but you're still resting the whole thing on that initial, um, that initial leap. So anyway, the Cartesian crisis is the problem that we are all now subject to an environment in which the facts are horrendously noisy. So much of them are based on reporting by other people who have perverse incentives. They're based on edits that make something look one way rather than another way. And so in any case, my sense is if I just go through my own history of understanding the John Kennedy assassination or the Bobby Kennedy assassination for that matter, there has been an evolution. And certainly my sense of who was likely responsible has changed. And I don't want to fault somebody for going through their own evolution where, you know, I mean, just even think about, think about what happened during COVID. Many of us yep. had starting positions that now look absurd. Right? Dr. Long... Drew was my, my guest last week and he was saying, I started out by saying Fauci is my lodestar. And now he's like, I wish I could take it back, but that was where I started. Right. And so my feeling is, look, as somebody who takes analytical work very seriously, it's better to be able to spot a good starting location rather than a bad one. But the real question is, can you move in the right direction sure. consistently? Can you read the evidence so that your model gets better and better over time? And um, I've talked to, to Bobby Kennedy about 
the assassination of his father and his uncle. It It's a really good match for what I understand the evidence to suggest. Um, I don't get anything strange off him on the topic, and I've also watched him interact with people ac across the political spectrum. So my sense is, yeah, he had a naive view of right and left that okay. colored his understanding of the facts, but um, he doesn't have such a view now. Um, you know, he, he will make common cause with anybody who's a, a, a careful, thinking, courageous patriot, as will I, as I assume would you. And no. I just, you know, look, a, a sociopath, they fool people. Have I been fooled? Yep, I have been. Do I think I'm being fooled by Bobby Kennedy? Wow, that would that would shock me to my core. But I mean, you can you can understand where I'm coming from. Where if there's a politician who is coming off in a very charismatic way, that's the first person you should be most concerned about. Um, yeah, but I mean, I, I haven't met him though. That's the difference. I, I mean, there's a lot of, and I'm not I'm not I'm not arguing through it all. If I spent FaceTime with someone one on one, I would have an infinitely different impression than what I'm seeing through the screen and through edits. That's not even a question. That's yeah. why I'm asking about it. Okay, well then I, my hope is that you do meet and I would be very interested to hear your view on the far side because my and, sense and, is this is somebody who's actually um, obviously putting his own life in jeopardy yes. because he loves the country. And I, I, I do wanna make a caveat. I, yeah. I think sociopathy is a prerequisite for the presidency. So this isn't something that's a disqualification in my opinion. Well, okay. If you want to, I mean, I, I, I have a view, a similar view that sociopathy is not well understood and that sure. what we really mean when we say sociopath is um, somebody, a maladaptive form of something for which we don't know the right term when it isn't pathological. Hey folks, I want to talk to you about Bone Charge. They're a holistic wellness brand with a huge range of evidence-based products to optimize your life in every way. Founded in science, inspired by nature, all of Bone Charge's products adopt ancestral ways of living in our modern day world. Their extensive range of premium wellness products help you sleep better, perform better, more energy, recover faster, balance hormones, reduce inflammation. The list is endless from blue light glasses to red light therapy, EMF management, and circadian friendly lighting. Bone charge products help you naturally address the issues of our modern day way of life effortlessly and with maximum impact. Let's suppose you want to burn more calories to help with your weight. You know who you are. Maybe you want to detoxify. You're eating badly. You had a few drinks. Maybe you want to ease stress and unwind. You may be very stressed right now. What you would want is their infrared sauna blanket. The sauna blanket works by raising your heart rate to that of physical exercise so it burns calories while you relax. You can burn up to 600 calories in just one session. That's like a treadmill. Sweating helps flush out heavy metals and other toxins and infrared heat and elevating your heart rate while relaxing it releases endorphins. We all love those. It's easy to set up. Heats up rapidly, and you can enjoy a session for 30, 40 minutes while relaxing, reading, watching TV, or this terrible podcast, which I don't understand why people enjoy so much. Here's the kicker. Bone Shard ships worldwide in rapid time. It's made from vegan leather, and there's free shipping in every sauna blanket with no hidden costs. Even better, easy returns and exchanges. You get a 30-day trial and a 12-month warranty. Go to bonecharge.com slash welcome. That's B-O-N-C-H-A-R-G-E dot com slash welcome. Use code welcome. You get 15% off. That's B O N C H A R G E dot com slash welcome and use code welcome to save 15% off. Let's get back to the show. I, I'm, I'm thinking specifically of the show um, House of Cards. I don't know if you saw this, where the first season or two, spoiler, Kevin Spacey is a House Minority Whip or leader and he's murdering reporters and he's just like, killing, like, just complete demon. And he forces his way into the presidency. And once he's president, he just basically governs like a centrist Democrat. So it's just really kind of, it's like, oh my God, he became president. And you think it's going to be Hitler. It's like, wait, he's like arguing for like filibuster reform and like marginal tax rates. It's like, okay. They didn't really, couldn't make him that bad. Well, I don't, uh, I did watch it. I don't remember it all that well. My sense was that character never moved from the category monster for me. Um, and, you know, maybe centrist Democrat isn't so far at this point, but <laughs> I mean, yes, I, I have lost all patience with that party to which I still nominally belong. But 
um, yeah, my, my, my impression is that you're dealing with an exceptionally brave, uh, deliberate thinker who is doing this for reasons, even if it works very differently in their mind because they're really constructed of different stuff. Um, if you, if you understood what they were actually trying to accomplish, whatever the label would be, uh, you'd find this person honorable. I, I would just also just say if he is seeking to make common cause with libertarians as a movement or the libertarian party to have any kind of equivocation between Gary, Barry Goldwater as some kind of, I want to get the exact word, a right-wing extremism, um, it, when Goldwater was by all accounts the most libertarian presidential candidate of the last hundred years from either party. I, I think it would be, and it'll be interesting to hear him say in all seriousness, you know, 64 is obviously a pivotal year. What does Barry Goldwater mean to you now? Cause LBJ thought fondly of him. JFK thought the world of him. Um, so I think there's a, a big, huge difference between, although Goldwater is portrayed as this, the Barry Goldwater of 64 and the alt-right of 2024. These are not in any way analogous animals. Um, I agree, and I would I would be very pleased and relieved to hear Kennedy clarify some of the positions that set people off because I actually think it's not a it's not a straightforward matter of being misunderstood. I think some of the critiques that are being aimed at Kennedy are necessary for him to tighten his understanding of um, who his allies are and why and what it means. You know, it, it's part of, if he were to ascend to the office of president, obviously he would be, um, it would be incumbent on him to govern as the president of all Americans, not yeah. just Americans um, who voted for him. And I think he would take that obligation very seriously. And this is part of understanding what all of those Americans are actually about. Let's switch tax to science because I'm really pleased to talk to an evolutionary biologist because I obviously evolutionary biology is not the same thing as evolutionary psychology, but I always tell people that if you want to understand, understand politics, instead of wasting time reading John Locke, watch the dog whisperer, that human beings are animals and this distinction between humans and non-human animals are enormously overblown and anthropology is much more of a um, guide to how people behave than you know reading National Review or, or something like that. One of the things that triggers me a lot as an anarchist, and I know it's going to trigger you, and I'm I'm just curious to hear your thoughts on this, uh, the whole concept of survival of the fittest, I, I'm constantly told that in an anarchist situation, as if there wouldn't be private security, but let's pretend there isn't private security, that only like the biggest and strongest would survive, which is why, of course, we have so many whales, polar bears, and elephants, and why there's no mice and insects and things like that. C can you... I'm sure you, when you taught, this is like the, one of the first thing you talk about. Can you talk about what survival of the fittest actually means uh, and how does it drive you crazy when people use it in, in the sense to mean only like muscular, tall people will live? Well, let's put it this way. The problem is I'm also kind of a renegade in evolution. Okay. Biology. So um, my perspective is not mainstream, but it, it there's a lot of the mainstream stuff that's right enough. And uh, so I... Um, I use it where it applies. Sure. Um, survival of the fittest is, it's like a functional tautology. The idea is, you know, oh, well, what are the fittest? Well, they're the ones whose phenotype best matches the environment. What does it mean, uh, you know, for it to match the environment? Well, it, it works best. So yes, the idea that those whose um, whose tools work best have an advantage over those whose tools work less well is, if it's not tautological, it's right next to it. Um, that said, its purpose is really to allow you to explore the process by which selection investigates design space and discovers mechanisms for being that previously didn't exist. Um, it has nothing to do, everything that you can name as you did, you know, mice, liver flukes, sponges, yeah. whatever. All of these things are highly fit. 
I think the way I would retool people's understanding so that they thought more clearly about these things is stop thinking about reproduction as the objective. It's not. Reproduction is one mechanism. It is a means to an end, and it is not the only contributor. And the, the end is lodging your genes as deeply into the future as you can from your present position. So in other words, the, the forms that we see are targeted towards making it into future rounds of the game. And there are a lot of ways to do that. Um, there's a, a uh, I'm going to say hymenopter, and no one's going to know what that means, but there's a wasp that lives in my area in the Pacific Northwest, the bald-faced hornet. It's not a true hornet, but never mind. Um, anyway, it overwinters as a dormant queen. So it builds this paper nest. It lives through the warm months and at the end of the season, there's a brief period of reproduction and the newly fertilized queen drops to the forest floor and is dormant uh, over the winter. So she's opting out of the middle part of the game, right? In yep. order to get into the future. Her failure to act during the winter is not some sort of an exception. The point is, how am I going to get to next spring? I'm going to get there by spending nothing over the winter and hoping I make it right? Any seed does something similar, right? It exists in a state of dormancy, either while, while it's uh, dispersing or while it's waiting for a hospitable season or a fire or whatever. So we are all trying to get into the future. In this way, humans are no different than any other creature. But I do want to push back a little bit on one thing you said, which is that the exceptionalness of humans is overrated. And I would say it is both overrated and underrated. I didn't say, I just meant the distinction between human and non-human animals. I didn't say really exceptional. I think exceptionalism is, is correct. Okay. Um, even distinction. The distinction okay. between humans and other creatures is massive at one level. Yes. And unimportant at numerous other levels. So the way we function, we are far less genetically programmed than any other creature. We... Um, our, our genomes have offloaded much of the heavy lifting of adaptive evolution to a cultural layer. And the reason yes. they've done that is that culture evolves far faster than genes. And so it's capable of adapting our generalist platform to a multiplicity of opportunities and environments by altering how we behave without genes having to change, right? That is a evolutionary super weapon. Yes. And while other creatures have some version of it, nothing has anything in, you know, we, we are orders of magnitude better at it than our next uh, nearest kin because we have language which allows us to pass abstract information horizontally between individuals, which facilitates this adaptive evolutionary process like nothing else. That said, many of the basic rules about what we are trying to accomplish are the very same rules that apply to other creatures. And in fact, Heather and I often argue that sometimes human beings are very confusing if you try to understand what they're up to until you turn down the sound on them. And if you think of them as behaving like, like some other ape um, and you just watch their behavior, often you can understand exactly what's going on. So if you, if you imagine a, you know, a lover's quarrel, for example, Right, you may be very confused about the claims and the counterclaims, and well, what actually did take place, and you know, why is this person focused on that? Right? If you turn down the sound, it's like, oh, you know, this person feels that the other person hasn't invested enough. Okay, now the second person is acting with contrition, which is suggesting that they understand and will change their behavior in the future. You know, it's much more sensible without the words. The words are actually um, they obscure. Yes. The underlying pattern more than they illuminate it. Yes. Humans are extremely inarticulate at times. It's not even inarticulate. It's like, um, it is a layer. It is a superficial layer that 
its purpose is more or less to disguise the actual motives. And actually, we find this all over the place. I was thinking today about some topics that are very hard to discuss and realizing that what's really going on is that some topics have been artificially divided into two teams. Everybody knows which team they are on and they view the other team as the enemy and they want everything bad to happen to it. But when they describe the situation, they describe it in analytical terms as if they've arrived at this position, not as a team matter, but as a, a matter of logic. And that is very confusing, especially if you do have an analytical position, it's impossible. You wade into this landscape and you make your analytical case and nothing works right because everybody else's case, or at least those who have divided themselves into teams, their case is not analytical in the first place. So it doesn't change in response to something you've said the way you would hope that it would. Folks, it's the new year and it might be time to upgrade your sleeping arrangements because that's something that affects your quality of life from morning till night. And I want to talk to you about Miracle Maid's bed sheets. They're inspired by NASA. They use silver infused fabrics and make temperature regulating bedding so you can sleep at the perfect temperature all night long. These sheets are infused with silver that help prevent up to 99.7% bacterial growth, leaves them cleaner, fresher, three times longer than their sheets, no more gross odors, and they're very comfortable without the high price tag of other luxury brands and feel as nice, if not nicer than sheets used by some five-star hotels. Stop sleeping in bacteria because it can clog your pores. It causes breakouts and acne. Sleep clean with Miracle. Go to trymiracle.com slash malice to try the sheets today. And it's the new year. Whether you're buying them for yourself or as a gift for a loved one, if you order today, you can save over 40%. And if you use promo code malice at checkout, you get three free towels and save an extra 20%. They're so confident in their product, it's backed with a 30-day money-back guarantee. If you aren't 100% satisfied, roll refund. Upgrade your sleep with Miracle Made. Go to trymiracle.com slash malice and use code malice to get your free three-piece towel set. Save over 40% off. Again, that's trymiracle.com slash malice to treat yourself. Thank you, Miracle Made, for sponsoring this episode. Hey, folks. Michael Malice here. You might know me as a Twitter troll, terrible author, insufferable podcaster, but I'm also an underwear model, and the underwear that I model and wear every day is sheath underwear. If you go to sheathunderwear.com, use promo code malice, you get 20% off and you can be inside my pants. Why I love sheath is they have special dual pouch technology for both parts of your male anatomy. It sounds weird. The first time I tried them on, I'm like, what is this? And now I literally wear them every day. The great thing about sheath, it was developed by an Iraq war veteran. And you know, overseas, it gets really, really hot. And Bobby decided, all right, What can I do to make sure I'm not suffering here in this heat? And thanks to his research, you can be comfortable in the comfort of your own home. It's great for cold weather. It's great for hot weather. It keeps you secure and comfortable. And there's something really exciting about going on a job interview, going on a date, doing a podcast, knowing that your underwear has you in its grip, nice and secure and comfortable. Go to sheathunderwear.com, use promo code MALICE. You get 20% off and you can get one step closer to looking as much like a hunk as myself. Let's get back to the show. Uh, I'm really excited to ask you this because I had a pet theory and this is the kind of, this could be like bong hit at a frat house, you know, kind of idea, or it might have some weight to it. So you're actually in a position to address it from an informed place. So I'm excited to ask you, here's my pet theory. One of, or perhaps the central insights of the paleo diet or lifestyle is the idea that our uh, environment has evolved faster than our biology. And that often there is this disconnect between the two. Uh, It could be as simple as we should eat better foods or more natural foods, so on and so forth. Great. My pet theory is, and I I haven't thought this through and I really wanna hear your thoughts, that a free enterprise system is so good at providing for Maslow's hierarchy of needs no one is starving in America. Uh, people who are homeless are often, you know, mentally ill. It's not, if they needed a roof over their heads, they could have one. Uh, you don't have to worry about being eaten by a saber tooth tiger, which aren't tigers and so on and so forth. Right. However, the brain or the mind is going to look for problems because for a long time, for all of evolution, you got to be worried about what problems are coming down the pike. And as we've gotten more and more affluent, 
this is why so much of politics is based on neurosis because the human minds are looking for problems where there aren't any. What do you think about that? Am I talking out of my ass completely? No, no, not at all. There's a bunch of stuff in there that's really, that's really good. Um, okay. I, I'm stuck a little bit because you've described it as a pet theory. And while this is going to make me sound like a pet ant, I swear to you, the world will be a better place if we start paying attention to the distinction between a hypothesis and a theory. Okay. Nobody does this well, incidentally. Physicists okay. are the worst. Um, but what you've got is a hypothesis, which is yes. great. It becomes a theory at the point that all the other hypotheses have fallen away. They've been falsified, and it is the one remaining uh, explanation. So your hypothesis, and by the way, were people to adhere carefully to that distinction, peace would break out in the Middle East. I'm virtually certain of it. The, <laughs> people would stop changing their genders. You'd be amazed at how many things would clarify if people would just keep theory relegated to that small quadrant of hey, things. Hey, Brett, evolution is no just a theory. Oh, God. Yeah. <laughs> well, exactly. Exactly. We, so we evolutionists get all bent out of shape about that, right? Theory means more than that. But then you go over to physics and they abuse the term in exactly this way. Yeah. So anyway, if we would all just get on board with this one thing, I think the rest would work itself out. But as to your larger point, first of all, people should know the book that Heather and I wrote, uh, The Hunter Gatherer's Guide to the 21st Century, is about exactly this problem. Oh, okay. Uh, we refer to the problem as hypernovelty. Hypernovelty yes. is the state. So novelty is when you're faced with something that you you don't have the toolkit for because your ancestors didn't experience it. Hypernovelty is the state when the rate of change is so high that even our incredible capacity to evolve quickly is outstripped by the rate at which the environment is changing. Yeah. And that gets even worse at the point that the environment that you're an adult in isn't even the same environment that you were born into. I had to teach high school principals how to use a software program. These people were above average intelligence, but it, it was like teaching like simple-minded kindergartners. And either, you know what I mean? And we're all like, you and I are already boomers in a, in a certain, in, the, in a colloquial context when it comes to certain issues. I have no doubt about that. So yeah. So uh, actually uh, a brief digression. I interviewed a guy, uh, Martin Agagian, a hundred years old. I met him on a oh. plane flight to the island that I live on. Uh, he was traveling alone. He was a B-17 pilot in World War II. Okay. I think he's the last one left alive. I'm not 100% certain of that, but I strongly suspect it. Um, and I, you know, he was so fascinating, sharp as attack. And I asked him if he would, he would join me on the podcast. No idea what a podcast was. Of course. Right. And I tried to explain it to him. Couldn't quite grok it. You know, it was... It's just a little weird, right? It's like um, a radio for the computer. Right. And so anyway, he was on the podcast. It went over great. People loved it. I sent him a link and his neighbor allowed him to watch it. He still doesn't know what a podcast is. So yeah. anyway, you know, imagine what it would be like to be a hundred years old. You know, you're born in 1923. Wow. Right. And you're living in 2023. Right. You know, I, I don't care how sharp you are. There's no keeping up with that. Of amount. course. Yeah. Right. But okay. So hyper novelty is the state when the environment is changing so fast that even our rapid capacity to evolve can't possibly keep up, keep up. Right. And what it means is that our ability to detect what, what we should do goes virtually to noise. Right. If you imagine living 500 right, yeah. years ago, yeah. your intuition about things would be good enough to point you away from things you probably shouldn't put in your mouth to, you know, yeah. point you towards things that were probably healthy for you. And at the, this point, nothing stand, has stood the test of time. So you can't really say whether something that seems great is actually bad for you or there's no, there's no detecting. Um, but you are certainly correct about a couple things uh, buried in your your model. One is the free enterprise system does provide for most needs so spectacularly well that we become terrifically sensitive to things that are off, that 
would have been of no consequence to even a recent ancestor. And uh, I, there is a name for this. I've forgotten what it is. There's a there's actually a scientific test in which, um, I, if I remember how it works correctly, you're asked to detect the amount of blue in some mixed color, and then the amount of blue is dropped until it's literally absent. But your detectors have become so powerfully attuned that you'll see blue even though it isn't there. And um, anyway, this has been hypothesized to be one reason that people are obsessed with white supremacy in a country where we elected a black man twice, right? The white supremacy is no longer an issue, but as it has dropped away, the sensitivity looking for any indication of it has gone through the roof. Can I add something here? Cause it's real germane. Sure. Uh, and this is in a very uh, dark mirror version of this. Stalin explicitly said that as the revolution continues, we're going to have to get more oppressive because that means that the people who are left are better at hiding. Interesting. Interesting. So that's how he justified all the stuff. He goes, "Look, they're 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 the they're the ones who are left, the sneaky ones. Yeah. You got to turn the, the thumb screws. We can't give up now. They're the dangerous ones." And he's not wrong in in that model. Well, he's not wrong also because um, they're the sneaky ones, and he's trained them. So he's he's yes. implicitly recognizing the arms race in which yes. And mind you, oh boy, we're going to get lost here from your original point. But there is years ago, I participated in a an experiment called Game B. Game B was a bunch of people from across the political spectrum who gathered to talk about, we already knew that civilization was coming apart and we were trying to figure out what the rules of a good functional civilization for the future would even look like. And um, why was I telling you that? Um, oh yeah, I remember. Um, I was very focused on corruption at the time. I was, I was ahead on this particular topic. And I kept saying, look, you have to build in the structures to prevent the corruption from happening. And others were like, look, we don't even have a description of a system yet. Let's deal with the corruption once we've got something worth corrupting, right? I kept saying, nope, you've got this wrong. The real problem is you need a system that des destroys anything that attempts to corrupt it so that you don't train things that become ferocious corruptors of your system, right? If you snuff out corruption in its, you know, infantile form, then you never get a corruption monster that comes after you that you can't deal with. Wait, hold on. It's, Did you know that this was an argument among the founding fathers? Did you know about this? No. It's an, Thomas Jefferson, in it, and I'm not making, they called it his anus, A-N-A-S. I don't know why that word is. He recounts a conversation between himself, John Adams, and Alexander Hamilton, my hero. And this is blue pilled versus red pilled. And Ham and Jefferson goes, the best constitution is the French. And at Adams goes, the best constitution is the English constitution, except for the corruption. And Hamilton goes, no, it's the best because of the corruption. And Jefferson walks away from this meeting thinking Hamilton's a loon. And Hamilton's point is corruption is inevitable. And unless you have a system that uh, modifies it toward benefiting the system, you're going to have a souffle because you're fighting against something that will always be there. It has to be accommodated and in, in some sense rewarded. That's interesting. Uh, that's very interesting, in fact. And it reminds me that there's a scene in The Wire. Did you watch The Wire? I couldn't get through it. Only the first season. Oh man, you, you gotta you gotta go back. I, it does require you to train yourself to understand what's being said because the language is so inflected. But um, anyway, there is a scene where I can't remember exactly. I'm from Brooklyn. I speak jive. <laughs> well, this is <laughs> Baltimore. It's beyond jive. But um, uh, but anyway, there's some city official is walking down the street, and anyway, he gets into a conversation with somebody about corruption, and somebody's like the corruption is really bad. And the other guy says, yeah, but there's always corruption. He's like, look, it's one thing when it's $1 out of 10, but yeah. when it's $5 out of 10, something along those lines. So anyway, back, back to the point though. Um, the, the system, I'm trying to recover where we were. Plan we were B. Talking, we were game B. So my Sorry. point to them was you have to 
you have to have a system that anticipates corruption and prevents you from training it. In other words, the rule that I would write if you were going to write a rule is attempts to corrupt the system have to result in penalties that yes. are so ruinous that it doesn't make sense to search the space. Yes, consequences. But not just consequences. The point is you're going to miss a lot of attempts at corruption. So when we catch somebody who's trying to corrupt the system, they have to come out so far behind yeah. where they would have been if they had just played along by the same rules everybody else is playing, that it only makes sense to do that, in which case you don't have a serious corruption problem. Yes. So, okay. Um, but we got here through talking about the uh, decrease in the level of blue and the increase in the sensitivity right. as something goes to zero. Your point was about the um, free enterprise system providing so well for people's needs that they become hypersensitive to stuff that shouldn't matter. Right. I was going to point out that there is also, though, a, a what I regard as a very unfortunate um, consequence of adaptive evolution built into our character. Okay. It's something that has worked marvelously to our advantage, but the fact that we can't turn it off is going to kill us. And it is your ancestors. Your ancestors, almost all of them were, I don't want to say starving, but didn't have enough food sure, almost yeah. all of the time. Right. And the reason that I can say that with confidence is that when a population has more resource than it needs, it grows until it no longer has more than it needs. So populations stabilize at a point where there just isn't enough to go around. And the consequence of that is that we are built to be stupidly miserly, right? So for uh, the example I'd use is one about temperature. We are much more sensitive to being cold than we need to be. Wouldn't it be great if you just didn't care that it was 45 degrees out? It didn't occur to you to be bothered by it. But instead, you go out and you're like, oh, God, that's uncomfortable. And um, the reason that you shouldn't care is because you do have enough food. And so if if you can rely on the fact that later on you can add 20% to the dinner you're going to eat and get back to wherever you were going so you can afford to burn the fuel when you're out in the cold, you can be perfectly comfortable. But the body doesn't see it that way because the body views calories lost as jeopardy to life, right? Because, yes, yeah. you know, you may be just slightly shy of the number of calories you would have needed to get through winter, but that means you're going to die. Um, we, are, we are built to preserve calories obsessively. And therefore, we become intolerant to what should be a minor convenience. Like, can I, can I, can I say something here? Because this is sure. an anecdote you're really going to love. Okay. I was talking to a North Korean refugee. He lives in the States now. And it, we were walking toward the train in the New York City winter, and it was windy as hell. And he's just complaining about how cold he is. And I go, weren't you homeless in the Chinese mountainside for like a year? And he's like, oh, yeah. And it's just the, the amazing ability of the human mind and body that you can live when you have to for a year in the woods, but now that you're comfortable, just that 10 minute walk to the train is hell on earth. To me, it was just fascinating. Totally, and it actually goes to another thing, which is very often some politician will have a, a hard scrabble origin story. And you'll think, well, that's bound to be a man of the people. And they just don't behave like it. And <laughs> What you don't realize is that the accumulation of wealth tends to be a one-way ticket. There's no reason for that person to remember what it was like to be um, faced with austerity or to sympathize with those who are still there, right? It's, there are people who do that, um, but they tend to be exceptional. It's also, I would say, I have a number of rituals that I go through that I think of as toughening myself up, mm -hmm. right? Like almost pointless uh engagements with discomfort like like cold plunge oh god that's such a white people thing seriously that's what i make fun of all my friends oh my god oh, don't. i don't know you're a weinstein you're you 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 have a more jewish name than i do and you do cold plunges my god it's pretty good man it's pretty yeah. it's pretty good um, do you do rock climbing like indoor climbing too no i don't and intermittent I don't fasting pumpkin lattes intermittent fasting i do yes 
They got to um, Portland. Got to you. They got no. To you. <laughs> well, they got no, to no. you. These things are well. No, I. All right, I'm going to make the argument. Exactly the thing that you're talking about. Are you crushing it in real life? Is that? Do you ever use that expression? I never say that. Well, you're gonna in a six months from now. I predict it. <laughs> oh no. Yeah. All right. Well, um, you're on the Whole Foods track. Folks, gold has soared past $2,000 an ounce. The wars in Israel and Ukraine, as well as rate cuts that are on the table, are fueling gold's meteoric rise. Deutsche Bank, UBS, Bank of America, JP Morgan, they're all forecasting sizable rate cuts in an election year. Jamie Dimon of JP Morgan, Larry Fink of BlackRock, they point out similarities to the 70s. In 1979, we had the Iran hostage crisis, war in the Middle East, and major cities in disarray and stagflation. Gold went from $158 an ounce in 74 to $850 an ounce in 1980. Meanwhile, our national debt is skyrocketing ever higher. There's a direct correlation to the national debt and the price of gold. In 2020, the U.S. debt was $23 trillion and gold was $1,500 an ounce. In 2023, the national debt is $33 trillion and gold is over $2,000 an ounce. Donald Trump warned that the U.S. dollar is no longer being the world standard and that will be our greatest defeat in 200 years. So here's what you can do. Call the proud Americans of the Patriot Gold Group today before it's too late. Mention my name. That's Michael Malice. And you'll always get best-in-class service from Patriots, protecting Patriots. Patriot Gold Group has the No Fee for Life IRA, where your IRA or 401k can be in physical gold and silver. And you may be eligible for the No Fee for Life IRA on qualifying rollovers. All you have to do is call 888 888- 505-9845 to get a free investor guide today. Or even easier, just go to malicegold.com. Patriot Gold Group is Consumer Affairs' top-rated gold IRA dealer seven years in a row. So just call 888-505-9845 or go to malicegold.com. Protect your money against the Fed and inflation. Sometime in the early 80s, REO Speedwagon's airplane made an unannounced middle-of-the-night landing. This is my friend Kyle McLaughlin, the star of Twin Peaks. And he's telling me about how he discovered a real-life Twin Peaks in rural North Carolina, not far from where he filmed Blue Velvet. What was on the plane was copious amounts of drugs coming in from South America. Supposedly, Pablo Escobar went looking for other spots, quiet, out-of-the-way places to bring in his cocaine. My name is Joshua Davis, and I'm an investigative reporter. Kyle and I talk all the time about the strange things we come across, but nothing was quite as strange as what we found in Varnumtown, North Carolina. There's crooked cops, brother against brother. Everyone's got a story to tell, but does the truth even exist? Welcome to Varnumtown. Varnumtown is available wherever you listen to podcasts. Let's get back to the show. Let's put it this way. If I start saying crushing it, then in order to break myself of that habit, I have to do a 12-minute cold plunge. (laughs) No, no, that's going to make it worse. Then you're really crushing it. No, the fear of a 12-minute cold plunge is going to keep me from ever saying crushing it. No, here's where we're going to make a bet. If you start saying crushing it, you're going to have to do something I did. My favorite food, which telling this to an evolutionary biologist is going to make the hair in the back of your neck crawl. My favorite food is Cadbury cream eggs. I own CadburyCreamEggs.com. Wow. And one time my friend Gino had a box of them. He goes, let's see how many of these you can eat. And let me tell you, the um, marginal benefit of eating Cadbury cream eggs is very low because at a certain point you're ready to confess to having done 9-11 because the vis- <laughs> it's viscous and oily and you're just like, oh, and your body's just screaming from all the sugar. Yeah. So if you start saying crushing it, you're going to have to sit down and eat a four pack of Cadbury cream eggs in one sitting. Wow, that is a really unpleasant thought. Um, <laughs> but no, look, I, I do think agreed, agreed, agreed. agreed. Okay. We'll, we'll do that. Um, if your observation about the, you tell me if I'm putting words in your mouth, but the lunacy, the obsession with tiny little yes. inconveniences that comes from having it too easy, stuff like cold plunge, is the antidote. Okay. So in some sense, maybe cold doesn't have to be the only way, but the extent to which a person can force themselves to engage something truly uncomfortable and profoundly so um, causes you to put other things in context, I think. So I I, I would advocate you at least try it. And, you know, the first time is 
uh, pretty jarring. But if you go two, three times, see if it doesn't um, if it doesn't seem to put things in their proper place. Okay, that, that's interesting. But but you so my hypothesis is not. Stu- is, it, there's a basis to it. I'm not completely talking out of my ass, in your opinion. No, I don't think you're talking out of your ass at all. And uh, what okay. I was going to point out is that we have this defect because we are um, the descendants of ancestors who were almost all starving almost all of the time. We have an obsession with streamlining processes. Mm-hmm. You will notice that a lot of American ingenuity, which by the way, I think is a historical fact of amazing proportions, which has a lot to tell us, right? The number of the inventions that changed the world that are American in origin is stunning. Yes. Um, But part of this is that we all go through our day and we think about ways in which the things that we interact with are just a little inefficient. And we think, well, why didn't they put this there? Or why didn't they remove that step? Right. And that obsession on the one hand is good because it does result in you um, inventing things that sometimes save a tremendous amount of effort. Sure. Right. But it's the obsession with the little inefficiencies that actually will drive you nuts. Right. In some sense, who cares? Right. These little inefficiencies aren't a big deal. Um, so anyway, no, I think your hypothesis is quite excellent. It has a lot to do with what's going wrong and it has you know both that organic component where we are obsessed with finding better ways to do things because that's how we got here evolutionarily was finding better ways to do things Um, but it becomes an absurd exercise in the context of an environment like ours where you know just the little literal diversity of problem solving stuff that you can find in a building called a hardware store you know, you should be, why you should probably, as you enter the hardware store, offer a prayer of thanks, right, for the huge diversity of stuff that can, you know, address every issue you might have in your house in one building, right? It's it's an it's an amazing fact, and we. I swear know. to you, I just heard what you just said in Ayn Rand's voice in her accent. You oh, should God. offer a prayer of thanks when you walk in the hardware store and all the things there that solve your problem. That's like the most Ayn Rand sentence ever. Well, let's put it this way: um, my my recent history has been an education and all sorts of people whose beliefs I once thought uh, laughable, yeah, well, I yeah. now have to engage differently. And so maybe that's just part of growing up. That that was not a criticism at all. Um, I, 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 to your well, but point, it, it hurt like one. Oh, well, <laughs> she was more than anyone a, a fan of the American ideal and American exceptionalism in the sense of creativity. Uh, you know, the, the Fountainhead, spoiler alert, uh, has this brilliant line at the end where the protagonist says, uh, you know, thousands of years ago, uh, s- some man created fire. He was probably burned at the stake uh, that he taught his brothers how to light. So her view of, you know, that in the, I always say this all the time that every great, um, I forget how I word this, it's much pithier on Twitter, but every great step forward has been done against the screaming of lesser men who insisted it was impossible. Um, and, and that's- That's beautiful. It, but it, 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 it's, I have it better when it's in writing if instead of off the top of my head. Folks, I encourage you to go to malice.locals.com uh, where Brett will be taking questions from you. Let's ask questions from, we had a lot of questions. All right, so wait, but I, I have a principle that goes right next door to yours. Please. Uh, every great idea starts as a minority of one. Oh, of, well, yes, of course. I mean, that's that's Randism 101. Oh, is it? Okay, cool. Oh, well, yeah. I, I have to remind people of this because of their increasing sense that the fact that nobody else believes something that you believe makes it wrong. Right. I'm not, but see where you and I disagree is I don't believe in democracy and you do. Um, I believe in the consent of the governed. Okay, good. That, that, I think that's our Venn diagram. I think that's a perfect Venn diagram. Um, and I agree with that very much. So yes. Um, Let's ask some questions from, are you, oh, let me ask this before we get to this, because I really want to pick your brain on this one as well. I, 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 this is really a very crucial issue that I've been grappling with recently and a very meta one. This whole enlightenment ideal or idea that if you put forth 
you know, a buffet of concepts or theories or hypotheses, whatever. And everyone has you know, this marketplace of ideas and puts forth their idea that humans are going to come to some rough approximation of truth and that's something they're interested in seeking seems to me to be completely inaccurate and not at, now we have enough data to show that that's not how things actually work i would love to really love to hear your thoughts on that well first of all i want to make sure i understand what you're saying so the enlightenment idea is you, brett puts forth his ideas and michael puts forth his ideas and you know dave puts forth his and we hash it out and you know the audience sits there and listens to everyone, hears them out, and assuming everyone is being honest and you know articulate and well spoken, through that we can find something appro approximating truth, and that is something that that, that audience is interested in in searching for. And I don't think that is accurate at all as a model. Okay, um, if you ask if that is a description of how we function, then you're right. right. It's not a good okay. Model. Okay. If you're asking if we can function that way, I believe we can, and I believe I've seen it and experienced it. And if you're asking if it would be a good thing, my answer is you have to arrange the incentives around yes. the system so that it is stable and so that people are rewarded for doing work that does lead you in the direction of the right model, even when they're wrong. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right. Rewarding people for getting to the right answer is one way of getting there, but it's not as good as rewarding people for the behavior that leads to right answers, whether there's, they get there or not. There's something really crazy in our discourse where the concept of incentives is often swept on the rug. And I've seen this. I'll give I, one very obvious example was like trans people in sports. I, it was some Fox News exchange and someone asked, why wouldn't I, as a male athlete, just identifies a female, then win all the awards. And the person just goes, yeah, yeah, that's not going to happen. And they, I think they literally hand waved it away. And it's like, wait, you're saying that no jock is would think this is funny or would respond to the incentives of, you know, having all these awards. I, it just seems crazy to me. Like there's not one who's just really that cynical uh, and, and that it's not, and you don't have to worry about it till it happens. And then what, like, Oh, who cares? It, it, that was to me. So, and that's a com that does not, not just on this issue. I think it's just pervasive. Right. It's madness. It's madness to imagine that there is not a small number of people at the very least who would take advantage of the opportunity if you leave the door open. Right. Of any opportunity. Right. Exactly. <laughs> and yeah, I, I'm, I, I do despair for how ridiculously poor the education that most of us got actually was. This is not a hard issue. What you're saying is effectively, um, a logical requirement following directly from assumptions that we all at least nominally hold about what we are. Of course, you know, it's a large population. There's a profit to be made. It doesn't require everybody to participate, but you're really saying nobody's going to do that? Or 1%? Right. And, you know, I get into this on other issues too. Like, okay, does is anybody, is any adult with an average IQ or better in the dark about the fact that we have a corruption problem in right. the West, right? No, everybody knows that. Okay, if we have a pay for play system at some level, do you really think that our enemies haven't noticed it and that they're not paying to get us to hurt ourselves? How is that possible? What force would prevent that from happening? If you think the force that would prevent it from happening is that it's illegal, show me the legal cases in which people have been convicted of this and are spending time in prison. Because if they're not there, then the point is the only incentive that would prevent it <laughs> is nowhere in evidence. Or, so, or here's, yeah. The, yeah. The other one is conspiracy theories. It's like, is, it your, is anyone going to say with a straight face that international elites will often have more allegiance to one another and their own status and power than to the countries of which is their natural origin. When, how could, it's, it's an absurd to deny, no one denies that, but, right. but, but that's the definition of a conspiracy. Right. So yeah, the, the idea, I mean, I, I do just shake my head. I mean, and look, I've faced some pretty dumb conspiracy theories about me. Of course. All things, right. Oh. So I know that just because somebody says it doesn't make it true. But the idea that calling something a conspiracy theory, I mean, 
it's wrong in one way. It's not a theory, it's a hypothesis. But <laughs> <laughs> but calling yes. something a conspiracy theory doesn't say anything at all about whether or not one should take it seriously. The question is, is it any good? Does it make predictions? Are those predictions manifest? I mean, you know, when, when somebody says to me that somebody is a conspiracy theorist, my question is, are they any good at it? Right. <laughs> Brett, we're running out of time. What has been your favorite part of this interview? I really liked the part up front where you said all those nice things about me. I thought that was awesome. <laughs> you are welcome. Hold on to your jingle bells. Pluto TV has all your holiday favorites for free. Enjoy Christmas classics like Scrooge with Bill Murray or Last Holiday with Queen Latifah. Plus, dive into festive channels like holiday movie favorites by Lifetime or Hallmark Movies and more. Download the Pluto TV app on all your favorite devices and start streaming holiday favorites on live channels and on demand. With thousands of free movies and TV shows, Pluto TV is your home for the holidays. Pluto TV. Stream now. Pay never.